In 1959, Miles Davis entered the studio with his band to record what became the best-selling, most influential jazz album of all times. Entitled Kind of Blue, it is in all respects the perfect jazz recording. But there were no rehearsals for this date. In fact, um, Miles gave the musicians the music as they entered the studio. And except for one song, each first complete take was the only complete take and that which got pressed on the album. So we ask ourselves, how is this possible? How can a group of musicians come together and so spontaneously create great music? Um, understanding the dynamics of jazz improvisation provides uh, not only insight into their genius, but also can serve as a model for how we can work better together in general. And I believe there are three key qualities, three pillars that give rise to the condition of what I call radical co collaboration or an intense type of uh, uh, teamwork found in jazz. The first is empathy. We each bring something unique to the stage here, but it's only when we come together that the great music can happen. And jazz musicians talk about having big ears, which means listening to others more than you're listening to yourself while the music is playing. Second, embracing uncertainty. Jazz musicians experiment in real time all the time, and they enter each performance with an open mind, with a beginner's mind, and they're willing to embrace the unknown. And third, following conventional patterns. Embracing uncertainty doesn't mean playing what you want. In fact, in jazz, there's a lot of structure and a lot of constraints even. Um, there are patterns in melody, there are patterns in harmony that jazz musicians learn obsessively. And it's only once these routines become internalized that the, the impro improvisation can happen on the surface. And one pattern that governs a lot of jazz improvisation is the form of a piece of music, the structure of a song. For instance, a typical structure is a 32-bar A-A-B-A form, and here's what I mean by that. We play a melody over a fixed set of harmonies across eight measures. Each measure is four beats. That constitutes the first A section. That gets repeated for the second A section. Then there's a contrasting melody and set of harmonies that we call the B section or the bridge. And then the form is rounded out by another A section. One of these iterations is called a chorus. And if you break it down, that's 128 beats, or 32 measures, or four sections, A, A, B, A. Or we can think of this as one unit. And very often, jazz musicians will internalize this form and feel it as one unit. Of course, we're also listening. So the harmonies in here also give us clues. For instance, that B section, the bridge, is, is a landmark for us and helps us orient. But a lot of jazz music is oriented towards this form. So what happens is we play the melody over the, over the harmonies across this form, 32 bars A, A, B, A. And after that, we repeat that form and those harmonies for the soloist. So the soloist is effectively creating a melody spontaneously on top of this form. And that's how we know where we are. This is the glue that holds jazz improvisation together. Um, and that gets repeated indefinitely until there's a signal, until there's a signal that we want to play the, the melody again, which is, by the way, called the head or the top, the top of the form. And th those signals are very often musical. So the, uh, the soloist will play a phrase or um, a musical figure that indicates that um, the, the solos are coming to an end. But there's also a visual cue that sometimes jazz musicians use on stage. And they'll point to their head very uh, briefly, which indicates they want to go back to the melody. So the song that we're going to play has an A-A-B-A -A -A structure. And what I'd, like, what I'd like you to do, the audience, I'd like you to follow along the form with us. And when we get to the end of a chorus, before we start the next chorus, just point to your head and see if you can, see if you can find out where we are. We're going to know where we are. And m maybe you guys can help out, too. If you... So um, for each chorus, even during the solos, um, just see if you can follow along where we are. What I want you to listen for as well, too, is the, the dynamic between the soloist and the band. So w when, when we're accompanying a soloist, we're actively listening to what they're playing and trying to fit into that. Also listen to the handover between the soloists. Um, as one comes to an end, the, the next may play the, those ending notes as the beginning for his or her solo. The, the last chorus that we're going to play for solos here, we're going to do something called trading fours. That's another standard pattern in jazz, commonly referred to as fours. 
Um, and the way that this works is we're going to solo over the first four measures of each section and then have a drum break for four measures. So if we do that four times, that fills out one form. But again, that form stays constant throughout, throughout this piece of music. Um, we've not rehearsed this at all. In fact, um, we just met uh, for the first time, met many of us, about a half an hour ago. So this is somewhat of an experiment. I, I communicated the name of the tune that we're going to play a few days ago, but otherwise, each one of these musicians accepted my invitation with very little knowledge about what was going to happen up here. Um, and the attitude was, we'll figure it out. Um, and it's that mindset, it's that mindset of jazz improvisation and jazz improvisers um, that I believe um, forms a found foundation for radical collaboration.
Brockfeld on flute. <laughs> Ken Fowser, tenor saxophone. Adam Lameo on guitar. Adam Lameo. And Nick White on drums. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so just a couple of observations. Um, during Andrea's solo, uh, for instance, she started playing what we call out. Um, and that means rhythmically offset and harmonically offset. And particularly around the top of her second, were you guys able to follow along, by the way, a little bit? By the, to the top of her second chorus, um, she started playing very chromatic, and that, that caused a reaction over here from Adam, and he started playing along, along with her. Um, during Ken's solo, he quoted the melody a little bit as well, too. So you have that form, and the melody is always kind of behind it as well, too, because that's going on. So he kind of grabbed that a little bit. Um, so that was interesting. We didn't know how to end that tune, by the way. There's, there's a standard way that to do it um, that you hear on a lot of recordings um, that has an extra progression in there that, that we kind of threw in there. I was hoping to end it a little bit shorter, but that was okay. So there's a little bit of negotiation there. I hope that didn't throw anybody off. Um, but um, there, was an extra, there was an extra couple of chords that we played in there. So another pattern that we find in jazz is um, something called a, a two-five-one progression. And if you play a B-flat scale, for instance, can you just play a quick B-flat scale? And you, and you build a chord on the second note of that scale, you get, a, you get a C minor chord. And if you build a chord on the fifth note of that scale, you get an F chord. So that's two and five, and then that goes down to one. Right, so we have these two five one um, patterns, and jazz musicians learn two five ones and play scales over that hours and hours at the end. So at the end there, we actually threw in a we we, we threw in a six five uh, six uh, sorry three six two five in there. So you have these two five um, kind of uh, relationships that occur in, in in jazz quite a bit. And as soon as we heard that, I think we all kind of we all kind of latched on to it. So that was a pattern that helped us end that song. Now think of your place of work or the organizations that you're involved in. Do they have these same values and do they have these same behaviors? Is everyone on the same page following the same patterns? Are you doing more listening than you are talking? And can you truly embrace uncertainty? Um, Peter Drucker, the father of modern management, likened a business leader to an orchestra conductor. But if you think about it, this top-down command and control model of management doesn't really work anymore in the 21st century. And we need a new model. We need a new way to think about how we work together. And jazz provides that model, I believe, in this brave new world. It helps us shift our mindsets, shift our mode of thinking so we can have business success. Some companies are doing this already. For instance, Spotify, the streaming music service uh, here in New York City across the river, um, they organize around small, empowered teams called squads. Here are the uh, vertical ovals there on this chart. And these squads are organized into tribes, and the, there's a lattice-type network of organizations called chapters and guilds, and this does not look like a corporate org chart. And they don't behave like a normal corporation as well. And in fact, in a video on their website, they liken this approach, they liken this style of working together to a jazz combo. Other examples include Valve, a gaming company in California that has essentially no organizational structure. They spontaneously um, merge around projects that are cool or not. Um, Zappos.com, uh, an e-commerce site with 1,500 employees, recently organ reorganized around circles and networks of employees in something called a holacracy. And uh, Gore and Associates, the makers of Gore-Tex, for the past 50 years of their, their existence, across 8,000 employees, they essentially have two job titles, a sponsor and an associate. And it's, it's, a, it's a hierarchy or lack of hierarchy that em values empathy for each other and it values um, e uh, embracing uncertainty. And this is not a nice to have. This is not something that's only um, limited to tech startups or e-commerce um, websites. This is something that will affect every industry. And writing about this in uh, the Harvard Business Review, uh, Professor Rita Gunther McGrath talks about three ages of management, the age of execution, the age of expertise in the 20th century, and now in the 21st century, we're entering the age of what she calls empathy. And here's what she writes. 
if what is demanded of managers today is empathy more than execution and more than expertise, then we must ask what new roles and organizational structures must be in place. All of the questions of management are back on the table, and we can't find the answers soon enough. Jazz improvisation, I believe, provides some of those answers, not only through inspiration, but through practical guidance. Work is not a place. Work is what you accomplish together with others. And in this day of hyper-competition, big bang disruption, transient advantage, we, we cannot ignore the fact that we need new ways of working together, new models of collaboration. The, the, the orchestra conductor model with an orchestra um, is, is old fashioned and we need to think more like a jazz combo. We need to think more like a jam session. Thank you very much.